gone through the mammalian cell types currently being used, um, recombinant protein production, and now I'll tell you a little bit about Cho cell engineering. Um, so, as I've kind of already mentioned, the, there are limitations of mammalian systems like Cho cells compared to yeast and bacterial systems. So, growth capacity, you just can't easily grow as much material as you can for, for bacteria, for example. Um, the cultivation time takes longer. Um, so you've probably heard that stat that if you start with a single bacterium and it multiplies once every 20 minutes, that after, is it three days you have more than the mass of the planet or something like that? But you certainly couldn't do that. What's that, sorry? Yeah, yeah, if you had enough, you know, big enough flask. Um, yeah, but you couldn't do that. It would take a long time with um, a mammalian system. Um, and then the, the product yield as well. The yields can be much higher in bacteria than, um, say, a Cho cell system. So um, pharmaceutical companies are, are making big investments into improving Cho cells to try and reduce their production costs. And um, I actually got to see this in action. So I... I visited a placement student a couple of years ago, so she was a uh, Medimmune, and so she was um, trying to improve production of a, a protein in Cho cells. And the way she was actually doing it, not by any of the ways I'm going to describe, but she simply um, stressed the cells. So she, she had various ways of stressing the cells, one of which was to really overgrow them so that most of them died with the idea that that's actually what happens when you do these big cultures. The cells become very dense and they start to die. But if you could select for cells that are naturally resistant to that death when they get really dense and start to use up the nutrients, then, uh, and, and then select those surviving cells, maybe they'll be uh, uh, better yield, isn't it? And her project looked like it was really good. It looked like she had actually identified a new Cho cell line that, that this company, Medimmune, could perhaps use down the line to, to, make, to get better yields of some of the proteins that they were producing. But I guess if you want to do it in a kind of targeted way, uh, you could think about um, overexpressing certain proteins to affect your Cho cell. Uh, you could do knockouts. Uh, you could do knockdowns with small interfering RNA or, or short hairpin RNA or you could modify expression using uh, microRNAs. So, uh, I mean, knockout is now very straightforward with CRISPR-Cas. You can very uh, easily knock out genes in a cell like a Cho cell. Um, and the whole idea is to get either certain gain of functions that you desire in your cell line or to have certain loss of functions. So, for example, you might want um, more productivity. So if you could... Um, maybe overexpress certain enzymes that might be involved in producing these proteins, you might get a better, better yield. Similarly, you, you might want an increased growth rate in the cells and maybe something you could put in might uh, promote cell cycle. Um, you might, you'd want to inhibit apoptosis because a response to uh, many of these cells, when they get really dense and stressed, is to die by apoptosis. But if you could maybe knock out uh, pro-apoptotic genes, you could create a super-duper cell that is able to withstand these apoptosis signals and, and grow for longer, produce protein for longer. You may want to affect the metabolism, make your cell more metabolically active. Um, you could think about altering the glycosylation, so you could knock out various enzymes that are involved in putting various uh, sugars onto the, uh, the carbohydrate structure, so changing uh, the type of glycosylation you have. And then you might also want to increase uh, secretion by maybe overexpressing or, or knocking out uh, a protein involved in, in, in secretion of these proteins. And this is a very complicated slide, but this is just to show you the, the kind of bewildering uh, array of targets that are being um, investigated by companies as they try to make better Cho cells. So each of these categories uh, on this figure now includes the various gene targets 
that have been explored and uh, they're kind of color coded as well. So um, A is overexpression of genes, B is knockout, um, C is uh, siRNA knockdown of expression. Uh, and then RNA interference with microRNAs to modify expression. And so you can see that apoptosis in, in pink features very, very strongly. So various, um, well, back and backs here are, are pro-apoptotic, so you'd want to knock those out to create your super cell line that's resistant to apoptosis. Or you could overexpress some of these anti-apoptotic genes here, such as BCL2 or BCLXL. Um, we've got uh, metabolism genes in, in pale blue, so you might want to overexpress some of these metabolism genes to boost metabolism, metabolism in certain ways. Um, glycosylation, so various uh, glycolytic, uh, so Various enzymes that are putting different sugars onto your carbohydrate structures could be knocked out to change it, or you could um, add them back to, to promote certain glycosylations, um, and so on. We've got uh, cell cycle regulation, so uh, um, overexpressing certain genes that could be driving uh, the cell cycle. And then you could also think about cleverer ways, such as um, affecting the RNA of certain of these genes with um, microRNAs uh, or uh, with uh, artificially created um, small interfering RNAs. So lots of things that, that companies are thinking about to create better CHO cell lines. So I'm, I'm going to briefly cover um, other eukaryotic systems now. So the bacular virus um, insect cell system, um, yeast and milk from transgenic goats. Had anyone done bacular virus before? It's not that common anymore, but um, can be useful. So these bacular viruses, they're, they're these large rod-shaped um, DNA viruses and they're actually pathogens for insects. Um, and so the insect of choice here is this um, uh, I'm not even going to attempt this. It's some sort of um, interesting moth here. And actually, the, um, the caterpillar of this moth is probably more well-known. I think it's called the, uh, the army worm is, is the caterpillar of this, this moth. Um, sounds quite a vicious sort of caterpillar, doesn't it, the army worm? Um, but uh, these are the SF9 cells that, that come from this organism and can be grown in culture. So these are the cells that... Um, are used to, to generate the protein. So we're not actually making the protein in the, in the moth or the, or the caterpillar. We're doing it in culture, so quite similar to a, a CHO cell or a, or a HEX cell. And um, the advantages of this is you can get uh, very high levels of protein expression um, and you get glycosylation because insects have glycosylation machinery. It won't be the same as a, a mammalian machinery, but still you will get some glycosylation. Uh, and it's very safe, um, unless you're an insect, so you're not going to be, we're not going to be harmed by these bacular virus. And these SF9 cells are, are, are pretty easy to grow. So um, there are some disadvantages of this system. So um, as I mentioned, the insect glycosylation isn't as complex as mammalian glycosylation. They don't have all the enzymes that we do for, for putting on the various sugars. And so it could be if, if the carbohydrate is really important, your therapeutic protein might not be um, active in humans if you make it in these insect cells. And also having carbohydrate that's not quite the same as human carbohydrate can sometimes cause um, allergic reactions. And then the, the way these cultures work is you, um, you infect your, you, you, you generate your um, recombinant bacular virus uh, containing your cDNA of interest and you infect the um, SF9 cells at just the right multiplicity of infection so that they kind of um, all get infected and, and, and don't lyse too quickly and have a, a plenty of time to, to produce protein. But ultimately, the bacular virus wins and kills off all the cells. So you don't end up with continuous production. You kind of get a burst of production, a bit like you do with a transient transfection. 
because of the fact that the, the bacula virus ultimately lyses all the cells in the culture. But the idea is once you get it in there, before it gets a chance to lyse the cells, uh, you'll get production of your protein because you've engineered the bacula virus to express it. Um, you can have instability of the bacula virus genome, so you can end up with some defective viral particles which will reduce your yields when you, when you do a big scale up. So it's not the perfect system, but certainly um, it is quite popular for, particularly in academia, I think, for certain proteins. Um, yeast is also used. Um, so um, here's our uh, single cell yeast. Um, it has advantages of being very fast growing um, and they are eukaryotic. Eukaryotes, so they have um, a somewhat similar secretory pathway to mammalian cells, and they also will glycosylate proteins. Uh, it's incredibly easy to, uh, gener to genetically manipulate yeast, so you can do knock-ins and knock-outs very easily. Um, so you can very easily introduce your expression construct, and you can relatively easily engineer yeast so that they would produce human-like glycosylation if you introduce the, um, uh, the particular enzymes that we have in humans for doing that. And the commonly used species, so Saccharomyces cerevisiae, Pischia pastoris, and this um, hansenular polymorph, polymorpha. Um, so disadvantages of this, so you, you can get degradation products and also the glycosylation is not going to be truly human. So it suffers from the same disadvantages of, of insects in, in that glycosylation regard. Oh yes, on to the goat. So does anyone know where this is? So here we have um, goats on the roof. So they're living on the roof of this country store and they can't get down. They have to live up on this roof. Any, anyone been there? No, any guesses? This is, where, this is the holiday tip um, part of the talk. So this is Vancouver Island. So if ever you go over Vancouver Island off the west coast of Canada, uh, go and check out the goats on the roof. It's quite a big tourist attraction. You, you see you know, coach loads of people arrive to look at the goats on the roof. But I mean, they're all right, the goats on the roof. You know, you kind of look at them and think, oh, yeah, that's cool, there are goats on the roof. But then after about 30 seconds, you lose interest, I find. But what's really, what's really cool about this place and what I recommend is if you just go around the back of this country store, there's the most amazing ice cream place. I've never seen such big ice cream. So my kids went there and they will just, like, eat ice cream all day. They couldn't finish their ice creams. It was, I mean, they're so big, you know, these whopping great cones with like a bucket of ice cream put on. It's not that expensive either. It's quite, I mean, they've got all the flavours. So I would definitely get out there. Uh, whoever you're with, pretend you're really interested in goats, uh, but really you go for the ice cream. Um, so Vancouver Island. But um, so the goats have been used uh, to make recombinant therapeutic proteins in the goat milk, okay? So I'll tell you this little story. So uh, advantages of using transgenic goats and using their milk. Uh, you can get very high protein yields in the milk, uh, relatively low cost. You know, you have your herd of goats and, and I guess you get a lot of milk from them and a lot of protein. Um, they're obviously mammalian, quite similar to humans, so you're likely to get correct folding, folding of the protein, and you're likely to get glycosylation that mimics that seen um, in a human. And so there is actually a product, so there's a company doing this, um, and you know they call it the transgenic animal bioreactor. So the way they started out doing this is they... Um, figured out that if you coupled up your gene of interest, your, well, your cDNA of interest, uh, and uh, coupled it up with a milk-specific promoter, that's going to target its uh, production into the milk. Okay, So all the milk from the goat will, in theory, will contain your recombinant protein of interest. So you take your mother goat, or the company did, and they took either uh, early embryos or uh, newly fertilized eggs, and then they micro-injected their DNA uh, in which they had their milk-specific promoter driving their target cDNA. 
And they then um, come up with the so-called transgenic goat uh, offspring, um, which will be, uh, in theory, producing the protein into the milk. So what you do, you test, you breed uh, this um, founder goat, uh, and then you test its offspring, the female offspring, to see which ones uh, are producing the protein in the milk and which ones are producing the highest level of protein. These will be the ones that have the, the most copies of this transgene integrated into their DNA. Um, so you then get your uh, fantastic founder female goat that is producing the most protein, and then you can mate it and you produce your, um, your herd of goats um, that are producing huge, huge amounts of protein into the milk, and you can um, uh, milk them and then isolate the protein from the milk. I don't know what you do with the milk then, you know, do you make yogurt or ice cream or something? I don't know whether there's a, a, something you can still do with the milk, but, but anyway, this was a, a big success story uh, in terms of production of this drug called um, Atrin. So this is a, a recombinant antithrombin uh, that comes from transgenic goat milk, uh, whereby the company have gone through this process of making the transgenic goats. So um, it was formerly a company called GTC by Therapeutics, but they're now uh, uh, Revo Biologics. I don't know the history, whether they, they bought out this company or whether it merged or something like that. But anyway, it was approved uh, by the FDA in 2009 uh, as an anticoagulant for preventing blood clots in patients who have antithrombin deficiency. And this is reasonably common disease, so it affects one in 5,000 people who um, have antithrombin deficiency. And as we'll see in a minute, why, but these patients are at high risk of blood clots, uh, particularly uh, during things like childbirth and, and, and surgery when they're likely to, to have quite an active coagulation um, system working to, to stop bleeds. So um, I thought I'd digress just a little bit into coagulation, just so you understand where antithrombin fits in. So um, I find coagulation a bit frightening. There's lots of um, coagulation factors, but this is a kind of coagulation pathway for, uh, for simple people like me, uh, without all the complicated names of coagulation factors. So the idea of coagulation is it combats vessel injury and stops us losing too much blood, and it works together with the platelets, which plug wounds, but platelets and the coagulation cascade are, are distinct processes. So we have our vessel injury, and then we get activation of our circulating coagulation factors that are just normally in the blood in an inactive state. And these coagulation factors are serine proteases, uh, cofactors that are required for them to work as serine proteases, and then they also need calcium. And these can become activated on a protein called tissue factor, now, tissue factor is not normally exposed to the blood. It's present on cells um, um, like uh, fibroblasts that would be just underneath the blood vessel. But it, if you get damage, you then will get uh, exposure of this tissue factor, which can activate the coagulation uh, factors in the blood. Uh, collagen, uh, a component of the blood vessel wall, again, that's not normally exposed to the blood, uh, but when you get an injury, you will get collagen exposed to the blood, which allows the coagulation cascade to start. And then also the, the activated platelet surface is, is very good for activating uh, coagulation factors or for allowing the coagulation factors to do their thing. And because these are serine proteases and one protease can cut a target protease and that can go on to cut many more uh, proteases, we get this very dramatic amplification cascade whereby uh, with all these serine proteases that are involved in the pathway, uh, starting from a single active protease, you can generate vast amounts of thrombin as a result. And thrombin is another one of these um, uh, protease, but it's probably the key one right at the end, and it converts soluble fibrinogen uh, into a fibrin meshwork, which forms, uh, helps to form these clots. And the fibrin will enmesh platelet aggregates that are formed at sites of wounds and, and stabilize the clot. And um, antithrombin is one of these balances to the system. You don't want this 
process going out of control. So we have a protein called antithrombin in the body, which um, inhibits thrombin and stops this coagulation going too crazy. But obviously, if you're unlucky enough to have mutations in antithrombin so that you have low levels of it or don't produce it, then you're at serious risk of having um, uh, increased coagulation and the formation of blood clots when you don't want them. And so that's where the recombinant antithrombin from goat's milk comes in and can be used to treat these patients. Okay, so just to, um, on the final bit now, uh, some clinical uses of these therapeutic proteins. So what, why do we want them? Well, I guess the most obvious reason, such as uh, in the case of the antithrombin, is that we want to replace a protein that's deficient in a particular patient, maybe because they have uh, a genetic mutation. Maybe we want to augment an existing pathway, uh, provide a novel activity. We might want to interfere um, with a molecule, inhibit its function if it's causing a, a disease. Or we may want to use therapeutic proteins as delivery vehicles for, for drugs. So a number of reasons we, we might want to use these therapeutically. And there are various mechanisms of action. So um, we can have them acting by binding non-covalently to their targets. And I guess antibodies are the biggest example of this, accounting for almost half of all therapeutic antibody sales. And these are the fastest growing. So possibly now we're over half in terms of uh, uh, sales of antibodies versus the other uh, recombinant therapeutics. Um, but also uh, uh, cytokines to stimulate the immune system, um, uh, uh, hormones um, or, or growth factors. Uh, another class of proteins are those that would affect covalent bonds. So these could include recombinant proteins that are actually enzymes. And then there are others that work actually without specifically binding to anything. So uh, an example here would be serum albumin, the most abundant protein in our blood and, and which is used, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in uh, intravenous fluids given when someone loses blood and you need to rapidly replace um, blood fluids. So um, amongst the various uh, non-antibody therapeutics, we've got um, various classes, so anticoagulants like antithrombin that we've already mentioned. Um, I'll come on to mention the blood factors in a minute, so particularly uh, the coagulation factors 8 and 9, which um, are deficient in patients with haemophilia. Uh, and it's really big business producing these coagulation factors to treat um, uh, haemophilia patients who have bleeding problems. Uh, bone morphogenetic proteins, engineered protein scaffolds, um, enzymes such as this glucose cerebrosidase that I mentioned earlier that, that is responsible for Gaucher's disease when it's deficient. Um, growth factors such as erythropoietin, so erythropoietin I guess became a bit infamous with professional cyclists, you know, they were all taking their erythropoietin to boost their red, red blood cell production so that they could, um, could, could compete better in their, their cycling races. I, I know a guy who used to be a, a professional cycler, actually, and he was with, um, he, knew, he knew Wiggins and, you know, some of the, the top British riders. He said they were all on erythropoietin. All except him, of course. He was a kind of whiter than... I think he was a bit bitter because he wasn't as good as the rest of them, but he, he reckoned, you know, essentially all cyclists at one point, all professionals were on erythropoietin to, to boost their red blood cell production. Um, uh, hormones such as insulin for diabetes, growth hormone, and then interferons, interleukins to stimulate the immune system, and then uh, thrombolytics, uh, clot busters that we mentioned right at the start, uh, such as tissue plasminogen activator. And so j just to, to kind of to finish off with the last example on haemophilia, so just jumping back to coagulation again, where we have our, our vessel injury and we have our dramatic um, amplification cascade of coagulation factors which results in thrombin production and uh, a fibrin meshwork to stabilize clots and this is what fibrin looks like in a clot so this is uh, an electron uh, microscopy image and it's been um, 
coloured so that the fibrin meshwork is in orange. We've got the red, red blood cells. We've got um, a green, white blood cell uh, here in the middle. And then these little grey cells are all the platelets that, that are also uh, involved in this clot. So uh, it's this fibrin meshwork that's the product of the coagulation cascade. And... Um, there are some um, pretty well-known diseases which are caused by deficiencies in these coagulation factors. So um, haemophilia A is due to a deficiency in the coagulation factor called factor 8. Haemophilia B is due to deficiency in factor 9. And then we have von Willebrand disease, which is due to deficiency in von Willebrand factor, or, or VWF. So um, I'm now introducing the very scary coagulation cascade, as you can see here. Um, so it, it effectively shows how vessel injury results in the production of thrombin, which then converts um, soluble fibrinogen in the blood into uh, stable fibrin, which enmeshes um, the clot. But we've got these various... Um, coagulation factors that are involved in the amplification cascade along the way. And if you remember, these work by as proteases, so one coagulation factor will activate the next by, by cutting it, and, and, and it becomes active. So haemophilia A is due to a deficiency in factor 8, and you can see factor 8 has a kind of pivotal um, position in the coagulation cascade. It's part of the big amplification loop that produces lots and lots of, uh, of thrombin. Um, but it's actually quite a rare disease, so only 30 to 100 cases per million. Um, it's X-linked, so it tends to affect males. And um, they have a bleeding tendency. Um, so... And, and the, the only treatment is to, to give them um, recombinant factor eight to restore their coagulation uh, and to relieve this uh, bleeding tendency that they have. And uh, an incredibly large amount of the NHS budget goes into treating these haemophilia patients because they just have to have this recombinant factor eight for the rest of their lives, otherwise they're going to get serious bleeds. Um, so, you know, quite interesting that a, uh, quite a rare disease gets this huge uh, budget uh, because it is very expensive to produce these recombinant proteins, this, this factor eight. Uh, Haemophilia B, uh, somewhat similar, but this time it's coagulation factor nine that's uh, deficient in these patients. But again, factor nine, like factor eight, it's on this amplification loop. So without factor nine, you don't produce much thrombin and you'll tend to suffer from um, bleeds. You know, you have a tooth out or something and you, it'll be hard to stop the bleeding. Um, again, it's, it's rare, so only six to 20 cases per million. Uh, again, it's X-linked, so it tends to affect males. And again, you know, they have, um, they have a, a strong bleeding tendency and they have to be treated with recombinant uh, factor nine for the rest of their lives. OK, and the final one is actually quite a common disease. Um, so uh, 10,000 cases per million. So uh, one in 100 people have this problem. So von Willebrand factor is a stabilising factor for factor eight. And it's also involved in, in platelet adhesion. So it's got quite a pivotal role in both platelet activation and coagulation that together are important for, for stopping bleeding. Uh, the severity can be really varied. So some people will have this and they don't even know they've got it. They'll maybe just have slightly lower VWF levels than they should have for some reason. Um, so uh, they have bleeding tendencies and again, recombinant uh, von Willebrand factor is one of the, the treatments for this, although there are also uh, other treatments uh, to boost production if you don't actually have a completely mutated VWF uh, and also uh, antifibrinolytics to, to counteract um, the bleeding.
Right, so um, to summarise then, so it's a, a multi-billion dollar market, this uh, therapeutic protein production industry, um, and there are a number of different expression systems um, that can be used. So as I've mentioned, these Chinese hamster ovary cells are the most popular. Um, other mammalian cells are used, and I think we'll probably see human cells becoming increasingly used. Uh, but in certain circumstances, the bacular virus insect uh, system is used, or yeast, uh, or bacteria, or uh, livestock milk, as we, we heard in the, in the goat story. And I think a take-home message is, is that there isn't a single perfect system for producing every protein. Um, you probably want to tailor the system you use to your particular protein. Perhaps start with Cho cells, and, and if um, if you can think that one of the other systems might work better, maybe move to that system. So, what you should know from these lectures, then, so some of the advantages of producing therapeutic proteins in mammalian cells as opposed to bacterial cells. Um, which are the major cell lines used for production, and then the basic method for how you would go about. Um, uh, making a recombinant protein if you were doing it yourself. So the, the stable transfection uh, and selection of cell lines or uh, perhaps using the, the transient transfection system, which is, which is quicker. Okay, so these were some of the sources I used. So three papers here, so bacular virus, uh, the milk, and then a review on therapeutic proteins in general. And then there are some, um, some more recent reviews, which are pretty good. So some uh, recent advances in mammalian protein production from 2014, and the art of Cho cell engineering uh, from 2015. And I noticed there are some even more recent ones that are uh, coming out now on, on the nitty gritty of, of Cho cell engineering for improving this model. Okay, so I think that's it. Thank you for listening.